Thank you, and it's good to see everyone. I don't know many by face, but I know a lot of people by name. Um, my wife Marion and I in Synagos are known as Eddie's parents. So uh, Eddie has told us a lot about many of the people in this room, and it's really great uh, to see uh, the faces here today. I was asked to talk about uh, our family's philanthropy, and really it's hard to talk about our family philanthropy without talking about the business philanthropy that I'm involved with. Just by way of background, Mary and I were born in South Africa. My parents were refugees to South Africa from Nazi Germany. They arrived there in 1936. And um, my late father and mother had a store in a place called South End, Port Elizabeth. And for those that have been to Cape Town, I think you know of District 6. And District 6 in Cape Town was one of the last pl uh, multicultural communities that was pulled apart by the apartheid government. Um, South End was the same. It was an integrated community. It had been around for probably 150 years. And then, as a result of what was called the Group Areas Act at the time, in the 70s, uh, late 70s, it was pulled apart. This was the community I grew up in. At, community where people of, from different parts of the world had settled. People that we would probably call refugees today came from uh, all over and um, built their lives there. It was a community where I learned where that people getting along could make a difference and that you could be poor and have a tremendous life. Mary and I came to the United States in 1976. Marion's a physician. We started, she worked at Baragwanath Hospital, the hospital in Soweto, and it was felt that if she became active in politics, that it wouldn't be, wouldn't be a good idea, that she should choose one way or the other to stay or to leave, and we decided to leave. We came here and we built our lives, business, um, and in, uh, raising a family. Of course, any charity that came our way, we would contribute. And then our kids, our son Eddie and his brother Paul, really brought us into active philanthropy. Um, it, uh, Paul did a project on BEE, Black Economic Empowerment in South Africa in his first year at college. Uh, he went to South Africa and then he came back and said, mom and dad, why are you not involved in philanthropy in South Africa. Eddie was involved in a group at high school called Students for 60,000, named after the 60,000 homeless in New York City, I guess, in the 60s. They used to take um, young people in the 14 or 15 years old to Nicaragua. Uh, it was a tremendous educational program. They helped these kids uh, build gardens, etc. The UN found out about it and they wanted uh, a school teacher that was involved to have a similar program uh, for Africa. Uh, the school teacher asked uh, for volunteers. Eddie went to Africa with the school program, came back, wanted to initiate a program for the school in, in Africa, the West Coast, and the school board said under no circumstances could the school allow this to happen. So at 16 years old, Eddie formed Miracle Corners of the World and got Marion and I involved. So our family believes that philanthropy is not only about writing out the check, but it's active engagement. And uh, Marion and I, and Paul and Eddie, are engaged in numerous philanthropic endeavors. A lot of it relates to uh, healthcare, of course to Africa, and to education. So that's the one side of our, my life. The other side is my company, Henry Schein, which is the largest provider of products and services to office-based healthcare practitioners. We have about a million and a half dentists, veterinarians, and physicians that buy their products from us and their services. Uh, Henry Schein was very much, when he was alive, and his wife Esther were very philanthropic. And anybody that asked them for a donation of products, they would give products or uh, a donation to. I grew up in a youth movement in South Africa that was very a socially responsible group youth movement. And I wasn't sure whether I wanted to actually undertake philanthropy in South Africa professionally 
or going to business. And in the end, I came here and was absorbed in business. And when I came to Shine, I realized that you could combine business and social responsibility. And at Henry Shine, we're a company of 21,000 people, and we've been able to build our business and create shareholder value around the notion of social responsibility and engagement in society. So uh, we have what we call five constituents that make up the mosaic of the Henry Schein su uh, success formula. The, these five constituents, one is our, one of our suppliers. We want to help them find ways to bring their products to market, and we want to do a great job for them so that they view us as the best way to bring their products to market. On the other side are our customers, these doctors that are operating primarily in the free market. Many of them get a good healthcare education but don't know how to run a practice. So we today help practitioners operate a practice so that they can provide better clinical care. And in the center is our team, bringing our suppliers and our customers together. We call it Team Shine. Uh, very much engaged in caring about the world. I'll come to that in a minute. And then our fourth constituency, we're a public company, are our shareholders. And we are very clear with Wall Street. Yes, we commit to a very good rate of return, but we're very clear that Henry Schein doesn't exist only for our shareholders. It's one of the five constituents that make up the mosaic of our success. But at the, core, the heart, the secret source of Henry Schein's success is our engagement uh, with society through the Henry Schein Cares Program. And I believe that this has been the reason why Henry Schein has been so successful as a public company. We've been public for uh, 21 years and we've had a compounded annual growth rate uh, in shareholder value of about 19%. Puts us right at the top. There are many studies, actually, that have emerged in the last few years that show companies that are engaged, not only in writing a check, but where the employees are engaged with the other constituents, provide a very good rate of return, better than companies that are only focused on the shareholder value. Of course, today, uh, millennials are the hardest uh, 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 human capital to attract and to keep. And yes, we know that millennials really only work for companies that are socially responsible, not only, but the majority. And certainly they will stay with companies that are socially responsible. But we have involved our company in public-private partnerships that have enabled us to work with, in a close way, the constituents that help us be successful. So, these social responsibility initiatives very much tie into our family's personal interests, but we've been able to engage the company in advancing these social initiatives. So, for example, one of the biggest challenges in the United States in healthcare is oral care for children. It was addressed a little bit in healthcare reform. I'm not sure if that part is even going to remain. So what we have done is we've developed a program with the American Dental Association so that on a given weekend, we provide dental care to about 300,000 children in this country. We mobilize about 30,000 dentists, allied professionals in providing this care. And we work with the American Dental Association. This program fits in very well with the Benjamin Franklin concept of enlightened self-interest doing well by doing good. We're helping our customers service their, uh, service the patients, the, the, the dental population of America, or the population of America that doesn't have access to oral care. So our customers are actually doing something that they want to do. But if you think about it, we're also working with our suppliers to give the free products. That aligns us with our suppliers and our salespeople are there helping to organize these events with our customers. The symbiotic relationship between the constituents is such that there is alignment of interest and we're doing good. Another program that we're engaged with is a program called Back to School. Our facilities are generally in, uh, we have about 400 facilities around the world in relatively uh, decent neighborhoods. But if you think uh, in Westchester or even here on Long Island, there are 
many, many children that actually grow up in shelters. And so they don't have the ability to go back, to go to school with all the instruments or activities and tools that their fellow students may have access to that come from more well-to-do homes. So we have had a program for 20 years where our team goes into the shelters, figures out what particular kids need, and then we have a party where we invite the families in of these kids and give them a bag full of whatever's necessary so that they can, in fact, have the tools that they need when they go to school to be in a position similar to a kid from a wealthy family or a relatively wealthy family or well-to-do family. What does this do? It brings us, of course, close to our team members who are very much engaged with management in finding solutions for people in the community. We have many, many programs like this, whether it is our disaster relief program, but the key is to engage in active philanthropy. And the net result is that there are companies that are doing this that are actually in the end, at the end of the day, providing a better rate of return than companies that are not doing this. And for those that are interested, there is an organization called the Higher Ambition Institute. It was born at Harvard. It's now loosely affiliated with Harvard. Where companies, and you will know some of them, like BD, Beckton Dickinson, and Aetna, but there's a lot of smaller companies, are involved in finding ways to make a difference in society by engaging all of their constituents. And there is now very good documentation to show that the rate of return of, the, of investments in companies that are socially responsible is a multiple of the rate of return of companies that are not socially engaged. So my family grew up in, I grew up with my family in Port Elizabeth, South Africa in this community that was relatively impoverished. I saw a lot there. I saw what the Shine family was doing when I got to the United States of being involved in philanthropy and was able, together with a team of executives, to advance social responsibility in a public company in a way that is actually increasing shareholder value. And so that is my story, and I'd be happy to talk more some other time. Thank you.